everyone, and welcome to episode 2 of Tem Talk, a podcast dedicated to the creature collection MMO Temtem. This episode is What is Coming in Temtem? A Look at the Roadmap. Before I get into that, I want to thank everyone on Reddit. I made a post um, about the show to introduce it, and I got a lot of positive feedback and great suggestions. So thank you so much for that. You know, a lot of the time, Reddit gets a bad rap for being a place where there's a lot of toxicity and complaining and mob mentality, and I've certainly seen it happen in some subreddits. And I'll be honest, I was a little nervous to post my, make my post and put this episode out there, uh, what people might say or what might happen. But people were overwhelmingly positive. They had a lot of compliments, and they had very polite and good, honest feedback. So thank you so much. I really hope and I think that it's an indicator that the Temtem community is above and beyond others and a really great place and we have some great players out there. So thank you so much for that warm encouragement. And especially a big thank out thank you to 81 Eclipse who mentioned to me something about Mac users. In the last episode I talked about the platforms that Temtem is available on and I mentioned how Temtem does not have planned support for Mac OS or Linux. But 81 Eclipse pointed out that he has he or she is playing um, Temtem right now on a Mac using GeForce Now and says it works great. There are queues and one hour time limits per session if you're on the free plan, but you can get the premium plan for three months for free right now or just pay for the upgrade. So if you have a Mac, this is great news and I hope you'll join us in Temtem and start playing if you aren't already. One of the points of feedback I got on Reddit was, you know, people would love to see some guests on the show or some co-hosts or guest hosts covering different topics. And I agree 100%. I have no intention of doing this solo by myself every episode. I'd love to get people from the community on. I'd love to get some guest hosts on. I'd love to get some experts from various areas of the game on to, to do deep dives into those topics, and I fully plan on doing that. So please look forward to that. Today, you're stuck with just me. It's going to be me going over the roadmap, sharing my opinions and discussions on that. But I'd love to, and I will get some other people on the show in the future. So please look forward to that. It would be really even exciting and, and maybe a big dream if I could even get some people from Cream or some developers on the show to do some interviews or talk about the show. I have no idea if they'd be open to that or if there's any potential for that ever, but if there is, it's something I will definitely pursue. So let's jump into the, today's main topic, which is the roadmap. Crema posted two roadmaps, a short-term and a long-term roadmap. And something they said right off the bat, of course, is everything is tentative, the schedules are tentative, the content is tentative, but this is an idea, it's a roadmap, it's the direction we're going. And right away, I want to talk about the very fact that they posted a roadmap. What does that mean? What does that tell us about Crema? And I'm going to tell you right off the bat, it's a positive thing, because originally, before this, Crema said they did not want to make a roadmap, they didn't want to post a roadmap. They had concerns that it would pigeonhole their developers, it would put unnecessary stress on timelines, and it would reduce flexibility of the direction they're going in the game, so they weren't going to have a roadmap posted. But so many players said they wanted a roadmap and that it was important to them and it's something that they'd like to see. Crema listened to them and they created a roadmap. So I think it's a great example of this company indicating what type of studio they are, that they truly are treating the early access period as early access, a way to engage with the community and let them give feedback and a, a pulse check for them to make sure they're developing a game players are going to love. And they've been very quick in responding to feedback. Um, some of the features I'm going to mention later on in this about how they've, they've changed features around in this schedule based on feedback and they're listening. So it just gives me a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings and it makes me trust them and, and I hope they keep on this course. And I'm sorry, it's a short-term roadmap and a mid-term roadmap. They didn't use the word long-term roadmap. So who knows, maybe they're going to eventually have another roadmap called long-term. But it's short-term and mid-term. So we're going to jump in and first look at the short-term roadmap. What's listed on that? What you need to know about these roadmaps if you haven't seen the graphics themselves, they're based on seasons of the year. So the short-term roadmap covers three periods of time, spring 2020, summer 2020, and fall 2020. So it means the stuff in this first category, spring 2020, could be coming out any time now. And then in a couple months, we have to look forward to the summer 2020 stuff. And then up to six months away, we could be looking for the fall 2020 items. So what is in the spring 2020 update? Well, they have five bullet points listed here. Ranked matchmaking version one, spectator mode version one, in-game chat, chat bubbles, and club management. They have wrote a few more details and expanded on some of these topics, so we're going to go do a little bit deeper dive on what they have discussed. So the, the big thing on, in this area by far is the ranked matchmaking version 1. 
They said, they talked about a few different things. First of all, balance. In early access, they're not going to obsess over the balance to have a perfect balance system um, because the Temtem roster just isn't complete. Um, the max level might not be what it's going to be. There might be more moves out of the Temtem for all we know. So there's just no point to obsess over making this perfect balanced ecosystem when we only have half the Temtem in the game. So they're going to focus on balancing extra overpowered stuff and that will break the meta. They don't want that to happen and they will balance for that. But they're seeing already, even in the limited meta of Temtem available, that various team compositions are being played. So they encourage people to try new things even before additional Temtem get released. So they said that the ranked matchmaking system will have a ELO system. For those of you not familiar, which I think most people will be, it's, it's, a, it's a player rating system originally designed for chess, but used in many online games now where your, your rating will increase when you beat a player and when you lose a battle, it will decrease. How much it increases or decreases will depend on your rating relative to the other player. So if you beat a player who has a higher ELO than you, you'll gain more ELO. If you beat a player who has an, a small, uh, a lower ELO than you, you'll gain less and vice versa. If you lose to a player who has a higher ELO, you won't lose that much rating. But if you lose to a player who's lower than you, you're going to lose a lot more rating for that loss. In Temtem, they're going to call it TMR, Tamer Matchmaking Rating. They said at the beginning, there'll be placement matches. And then after your placement matches, um, each time you queue up for a ranked battle, you'll be placed against someone who has a similar TMR. They have confirmed that you will be able to earn pan suns through this for each battle against players and for the time you invested. So I think that's amazing. I think a lot of players would do ranked matchmaking just for the fun of it, but the way that it can be a, a way to farm money and, and provide an income just makes it even better. But they did put an asterisk saying that they're going to probably disable the ma money making part of the feature right when it first implements, and they'll wait till it's fully tested and stabilized, and then you'll be able to start earning that money from the ranked matchmaking. So, and that's coming soon. Players are going to be looking forward to that. Now, the biggest reveal and the most exciting part of the news about this is auto-scaling. They decided um, to go with an auto-scaling in ranked matchmaking specifically. What this means is, and the, and the reason they did this, they said, is they want to encourage competitive players to be able to jump into ranked matchmaking right away. And they want it to be easy for players to test new things, tweak their system, and, and bring different temtem to their team compositions. They want it to be something that people can change and play with and really um, theory craft in without having to spend a ton of money and time breeding perfect Temtems. So in ranked matchmaking, Temtems will auto scale up to perfect SV50. So you don't need to breed for perfect Temtem in ranked matchmaking. They'll also auto scale up to the max current level. What you will need to do is you'll still need to train these Temtems TVs either out in the world or using fruits. You'll still need to collect all the gear and items that you want them to hold. And you'll need to breed Temtem for egg moves still. So there'll be some time investment, but the point is they didn't want to make a big time gate. They wanted to be the PvP content to be accessible and for it to be able to, for metas and teams to change frequently and not be gated behind a big time investment. Um, so a lot of players are very excited about that. You know, I saw some, uh, maybe dramatics, too much of a statement, but dramatic uh, posts saying, oh, I'm going to come back and reinstall Temtem now that I see that. Um, you know, I don't have to spend hours grinding money to get perfect temptem to participate in the PvP content. So I think people are very happy about it. Um, you know, I was a little hesitant at first because as someone who does want to spend a lot of time grinding in the game and, and get perfect temptem and breed temptem and make a lot of money, I want to have rewards and incentives for that. And seeing that that wouldn't be this, you know, as at first I was worried, but as I read about it more and looked at the other stuff in this content, they did say that ranked matchmaking will be the only game mode where auto scaling occurs. And in all other game modes, auto scaling won't incur, so there'll be plenty of areas of the game to incentivize having perfect temtem and through breeding. Um, they pointed to the in-game tournaments, for instance, won't have auto scaling. The end-game PVE will um, you'll be incentivized to use auto scaling, and the dojo wars, which is the the club uh, player versus player group uh, PVP content, also will encourage it. So there's going to be plenty of stuff in the game that does make you want to have perfect temtem and breed. So I think it's a really great middle ground. I'm very happy with the decision in the end after I've mulled it over. It's gonna let casual players PVP. It's gonna let players that don't have a lot of time PVP and have a lot of fun PVP. And in PVP, isn't, the ranked matchmaking system isn't gonna be 
something based on whoever spends the most time preparing Temtem is going to do the best. It's really going to be whoever is the best strategic thinker and that has the best skill at rank matchmaking will succeed in that area. But for players who aren't like super into that hyper competitiveness and the skill basedness and want to be rewarded for time spent investing in Temtem, there'll also be rewards for that. You'll be able to do well in in game tournaments and the Dojo Wars and the PVE. So everyone hopefully will be happy. So I think it's a great direction and I'm, and I'm happy to see them reveal this information. So uh, the next thing in this area that I mentioned was the spectator mode version one. So they said it'll be um, a pretty basic spectator mode and it's going to be the first iteration. They are going to iterate on and add more features for now. For now, it's just going to be a basic mode, but they're doing this to allow um, player run tournaments to have a, to be better supported. And this is another one of those areas where I was talking about Krima listening to the, the community and wanting to support the community. They specifically said that they always were going to have a spectator mode, but it wasn't planned until a lot later in the development cycle. But so many players in the early access said, we want a spectator mode, we want to be able to run our tournaments better. Um, it's really kind of janky how people are, are, are streaming the tournaments right now. So Cremo was like, okay, we hear you. We're going to get a spectator mode. Our players want, our community wants. It's going to make our community healthier and grow. So we're bringing spectator mode in our first um, area of the roadmap. So again, it's just part of that thing that I think is really reinforcing their behaviors. If you take a step back and look at what they're doing and their decisions, you know, you might be, there might be players upset over certain small little decisions here and there and, and want to be sensational. But if you really look at these patterns, I think it tells a good story that we should all be excited about and have some confidence in. So the remaining topic in spring 2020 is an in-game chat, chat bubbles, and club management. They said that chat will have predefined groups such as global, local trade, and club. Private messaging will be possible, like whispers to other players. And chat bubbles will appear above characters' head talking in-game, but that there will be settings for these chat bubbles. You'll be able to choose to display the text in the chat bubble in-game if you want, or you can just get a notification that the player's talking. So it'll be like a little smaller chat bubble, like a dot, dot, dot appearing or something. Or you can choose to disable them entirely. So they're giving players plenty of flexibility with the chat system that's coming. Um, club management is going to have two features, they said primarily. The first one being just the ability to create a, a, a club, which is their take on clans. You'll be able to name it. You'll be able to design a banner or like a logo. And you'll be able to invite your friends to the club. And the second feature or part of clubs is going to be coming in the winter 2020 part of the roadmap, and that's Dojo Wars, which is very exciting, and we'll get to that once we start looking at the midterm roadmap. So that concludes what we're looking forward to in spring 2020. So we're going to be able to look forward to some ranked matchmaking, spectator modes, in-game chats, and clubs coming soon. Very soon, hopefully. And following that, we have the summer 2020 update. Now, there's going to be a new island introduced for the main storyline called Kisawa, and there'll be 25 new Temtem added as well. In addition to this, there's going to be player housing. They're going to add the climbing gear, and they're going to add emotes version 2. Um, in case you've missed it, which I don't think most people playing the game have, but there's, there's areas in the game with little rock climbing walls. Um, that in theory your character could climb if your character had climbing gear, but we don't have that given to us in game yet. But they're going to give us that climbing gear in the summer, um, and that will allow you to access more areas on the maps that we currently can't get to. The main thing in this area that they talked about on the blog post on their website about this was the housing. They, they talked a little bit about what this feature will look like. They said there's not going to be a limited amount of houses. There'll be an, an infinite amount, so every player will get a house. There's not like limited plots of land available or anything like that. What players will do is they'll decorate their inside of their home with furniture and decorations. And predominantly, that will be the feature of housing is, is decorative. But players will be able to invite other players over to their home. Um, and there will be a great social aspect to it. So I think housing's fun. I think it adds to the MMO feel of it. I think it will be really neat, especially with, since they're adding clubs right before this people can have club meetings and gather together and have club houses even as someone's house and so it's a really great mmo feature now with that said i always think that or i don't always think but i have the opinion that player housing is kind of something that me included but every player we overhype the idea in our head we're like oh we want our own home in the game and in this own virtual space and that's really exciting and cool and when we get it we're going to be really into it and we're going to design it and lay it out but once you've designed your home once you've been in it you might there's not a lot of content there to do and so it's something that usually gets left behind and isn't it's something that we always think we always want but we don't really want that much we'll see i don't know i'm still excited for it don't get me wrong but and the only reason i even mention this is because 
Crema goes on to say that they, in, beyond the predominantly being decorative and social aspect of housing, they are going to include useful furniture items. And this is like where I perked up. I was like, all right, cool. Now I'm really into this feature. And they said, think of things like an incubator, a jukebox, or a fruit tree. So the incubator item uh, presumably will be something that will incubate eggs that you've gotten through breeding, so you don't have to keep them in your party. So that's a great feature. The jukebox will allow you to play music, I can only assume, within your home. And the fruit tree, again, I assume and speculate, will allow you to grow the various fruits that allow you to manipulate TV values, either increase them or decrease them. So you'll be able to grow your own fruits and save some money and like have a little garden inside your house. So I think that's cool. I think that's a great step. I, I like the idea of housing. I don't know how useful they are for the longevity of the game, but if they're going to add meaningful content and value out of the housing, I think that's great, and it makes it a lot more exciting. The other things that mentioned in this area for the spring 2020 are emotes version 2, which, again, they don't say anything about, but there'll be more emotes they'll be able to do. So look forward to that. All right, our final category on the short-term roadmap is fall 2020. And the bullet points listed under this is another new island called Kipanuku, for all I know. I'm probably not pronouncing that well. There's going to be 25 new Temtem as well. And they're going to also introduce the first mystic, mythical Temtem, which will be their take on legendaries. So there's going to be three total. The first one's coming in the fall. Um, they're also going to introduce in-game tournaments, the quest diary, and achievements. Now, out of these, these topics, the only thing that they went into detail about was the achievements. And they talked about how people like achievements, so they're going to include them in Temtem. They'll be available on every platform, assuming the platform supports an achievement system. And there'll be a full array of achievements with a, um, you know, a variety of difficulty. And they said that you know the biggest currency and reward for achievements is breaking rights. But they will potentially add some in-game rewards as well. So that's something fun to look forward to. I'm looking at these other things and just speculating without them going into detail. The quest diary is pretty self-explanatory. Right now, the quest system is kind of clunky. You can only see whatever quests are displayed on the right side of your screen. And it's like three or four quests. And you can't manipulate that list. You can't go look at other quests. You can't see how many you have outstanding and go read the details. So it's a little frustrating if you're trying to clean up your quest book right now. It certainly is. And it's certainly one of the few areas where I'm like, oh yeah, this was an early access game. I forgot. Now I've just been reminded. But... By the fall, we're going to have a quest diary that lets us fully navigate the quest book. You know, I think that's great. I don't think it's a high priority. I'm glad it's coming. I'm glad it's not coming in the first update. Um, In-game tournaments will be really cool. They don't say anything about them. But, um, you know, under the ranked matchmaking, they did mention that there won't be auto-scaling in in-game tournaments. So we know that. We know that the bread Temtem teams will be important there and that people have time to get them. There isn't a rush. You know, don't burn yourself out trying to farm money and breed Temtem. You have until the fall, honestly, until you're going to need them. You don't need perfect SV Temtem for the story coming this summer. Uh, but So the first time that actually having bread Temtem will matter is, is in the fall. And I can only assume that the rewards for in-game tournaments will be above and beyond what we get from ranked matchmaking and that you'll be able to get either more money or something special. So I don't know what, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so now let's move on to the midterm roadmap. And the first area that that begins with is Winter 2020. And the first thing listed here is another new island called Arbury. And there'll be 30 more new Temtem and a second mythical Temtem added. So at this point, the main storyline should be completed as of the winter of 2020. So within the next 12 months or so, or roughly a year away, less than a year away. It could be nine months away. Who knows exactly? You know, the dates of purposefully, they haven't listed dates in this. And that's, that's just fine with me. I, I get that. You know, I want the content to be released when it's done, when it's polished, when it's good, when it's ready. Don't rush it out. Um, there's that famous quote from the Nintendo developer that, um, people won't remember if a game was late, but they'll remember if a game is bad or, or something like that. So uh, I, I hope they take their time to get the good content out to us um, when it's fully developed and fully baked. Anyways, back to the, the Winter 2020. They also list out Club Dojo Wars, which are really exciting. Traded Houses, Trading House, um, Ranked Matchmaking Version 2, and Spectator Mode Version 2. So I just want to say that I think Winter 2020 is going to be the really big content update and really the exciting time to be in the game if you're someone who's like kind of holding off on really time and making an investment in the game and playing the game or buying the game until there's a lot to do i think you don't need to wait any longer past this point the main storyline is going to be full in the game they're going to have um, the remaining three islands so six islands total they're going to have all of the non-legendary temtem added it looks like 
and two of the three legendaries. So all so basically, um, we'll have the main storyline complete. We'll have all the Temtem in the game, and and that part of the game will be there. But on top of that, these other features, the Dojo Wars, the Trading House, the Ranked Matchmaking version two, is going to be more of that end game content finally introduced into the game beyond just farming money like we can right now. So let's take a deeper look at some of these items and review what they talked about on the website about them. And the first being the Club Dojo Wars, which I don't know, honestly, out of everything on this, this is what has me the most excited personally. So they said there's going to be six Club Dojos, one per island. So these are separate from the dojos you play in the storyline. And that clubs will be able to conquer and hold these dojos, and then other clubs will be able to challenge them through in-game tournaments and battling other clubs during predefined time frames. Um, and then once a dojo is conquered, um, the dojo owners and the members will be able to decorate it and obtain rewards during that time held. So I think that's a fascinating sounding feature. I can't wait for it. I'm really excited. Basically, it's going to be there's going to be these dojos on the map that players own and kind of set themselves up as their own dojos or gym leaders, like just out of the 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 Pokemon world of you know who's who's ever played Pokemon and not want to imagine you know RPing and thinking that, oh I want to be a gym leader and have my own gym. Well, you and your friends can totally do that now, and other players will come and battle you and try to conquer you, and 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 you can go conquer and battle other players with their dojos, and we're gonna get rewards for it. So, dojo rewards, do, uh, the club dojo wars are gonna be really exciting. Uh, the next thing up is the trading houses. Players will be able to post and receive offers on their Temptum that they're trying to sell. It's going to act as a bulletin board and be able to sort through listings. So what that sounds like is it's not... They said tentatively they have ideas such as timed auctions, live auctions, random trains, but not guaranteed at launch. So the trading houses aren't going to be like your traditional auction house from an MMO where you post a, uh, a Temptum and people bid on it and then it expires and you get the money. It's, it's just going to be... It's going to be a system to interact with your listings and make listings and make offers and accept offers all in-game. Right now, this is all happening. Player, there's a huge trading economy, and breeders are making a lot of trades and exchanges. But it's all happening through discords, and and primarily the official discord, but other ones as well. And there's also some third party websites out there. But they're gonna put this all in the game, so there's systems to do within the game that's gonna make it a lot easier. And and I hope they move forward with the thing with the timed auctions and live auctions. I think that will be a nice touch as well. Uh, Crema did mention that they know there's a lot of hype for trading hubs, and people want them. And they uh, appreciate that it's something that people probably want to see as early as possible. But they have it listed in fall 2020 because they say, you know, it's a technically challenging and they want to develop it properly. They want to get it right. And they know it's such an important feature that they don't want it to be, you know, rushed. So I appreciate that. I appreciate them respecting and acknowledging that this is, is, is wanted, but it's something that they need to take the time to do right. Kind of what I was talking about earlier. But um, then going on, they talk about ranked matchmaking version 2. And they said that in this version, they're going to they're gonna introduce like leagues or medals. Think of bronze, silver, and gold. Though they're going to find more clever names. They said for the different leagues, probably something more Temtem related. And that there'll be seasons uh, within the ranked matchmaking. And you'll get a reward based on where you finish in that season um, and your position, what league you're on and where you're rated within the league. So that's really exciting. It adds on that not only will you make money for each time you do battles, but you'll be able to earn rewards based on your placements and how high you can battle up the ladder, basically. And they said that their plan is to have a one preseason that will go on until the game launches, and then they have periodic seasons. And then their balance decision is going to, they're going to try to only balance patches between seasons so that for each season, the competitive meta is stable in the same scene and consistent for that season, and then it will be balanced and changed for the next season. I think that's really great. I think it's really interesting, and I think this talks a lot about what we can see to come for the game, which I'll, I'll circle back to in a moment. But first, let's look at the spectator mode version two. They said they're orienting uh, this this re, this iteration of the spectator mode for the completely for the pro professional scene. There's going to be um, lobbies where you can invite spectators and casters. And there'll be more spectating options, statistics available, and just a lot of options towards organizing casting pro tournaments efficiently. So it's really them empowering and enabling their community. So what do you what can we read into these things? This ranked matchmaking, these seasons of spectator mode. What what I see into it is I see the long-term legs of the game showing themselves. I see that 
there's going to be incentive to keep playing the game season to season. It's not going to be something where you just play through the storyline once and you can PvP bat players for a little bit, but it doesn't really go anywhere. There's going to be engagements and reward, and they're designing a lot of systems to keep us engaged and keep it fun. Um, that the the seasons the seasons are really in, indicative that you know we can expect the the meta to never be stale and changes to constantly be happening. And and the temp temp team you have in one season, you know, is going to want you're going to want to change it for the next season based on the balance changes. So you're going to comp- constantly be iterate, iterating on uh, what Temptum you want to PvP with. And the Spectator Mode version 2 is just another sign that they really want to support their uh, community. They want to give tools to the community to run with itself and create their own content. And that they hope the game has like an online presence and, and dare I say, possibly even like kind of some esports that might come out of this game uh, if, if we're so lucky. But you know, it's not all about the PvP. The the trading houses is going to be is for the breeders and the the players that want to make money. There's a little bit of everything in this winter update. I think there'll be the whole storyline to play through for casual players, for players that want to breed Temptem and be full time breeders and just make money and amass as much wealth as possible. They're going to have the tools to do that. The players that want to be in clans and social and hold dojos are going to be able to do that. The people that want to be hyper competitive in PvP are going to be able to do that. There's a little bit for everything in this Winter 2020 update, and I think it's really going to be the full blossom of the game. Moving on, though, we have the Spring 2021 category on the Midterm Roadmap. So what's listed here? Well, we have Console Ports, the 1.0 launch, an Endgame Island, Daily and Weekly Quests, the Battle Replay System, and a Cosmetics Store. They discuss in the console ports again, and they reiterate how they they want cross-play to be in the game, and they want cross-saves to be enabled. They say that neither of them are, are guaranteed, but they think both are possible. They think the cross-play will be the easier of the two, and they feel pretty confident cross-play will be possible. So you'll be able to play with any of your friends on any of their consoles, no matter which one they're on. Um, the cross-saves, they said, is a little more challenging, and there's a lot more technical requirements, but they think they can figure it out. Of course, it's dependent on the console platforms themselves to make it possible and not be too restrictive. But if it is possible, it's something that they want to do, and I, and I really hope they're successful. And It just means that you're going to be able to play this game on any device with any of your friends at any time without restrictions preventing that, which is just a feel-bad moment, of course. So, you know, personally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be playing most of the game on my PC at home. But if I want to go mobile, if I'm traveling, if I'm on a flight or just out and about, I can play on my Switch. Or I can plug my Switch into the TV downstairs in the living room and sit on the couch and play Temptem. And I'm going to be able to do all of it, hopefully, with the same character and the same save file. Um, if there isn't cross saves, of course, then I'm not going to want to switch between different consoles. I'm going to want to stay on just my, my main one. So I'm looking forward to this. I think it's exciting. Next up, they talk about the Endgame Island. They say it's going to be fully dedicated to Endgame activities, and it's going to be similar to the Battle Frontier and you know what game. So wink, wink, nod, nod. They're talking about Pokemon here, of course. Uh, they said there's going to be three, four, five buildings, um, each with their own mechanics, all relative to Temtem battles, and players will be able to enter these buildings and win rewards based on performance. It's going to be mostly focused on PvE activities and reward players with Pansons and other items for time invested. So this is what they're talking about when they said that the end game PVE content, Perfect Bread Temtems will have value. If you're taking the time to breed Perfect Temtem, you're going to get the most out of the end game island and be able to have the best results and the best rewards. But I have a feeling it's not going to be mandatory to participate. If you're someone who doesn't want to have a full team of Perfect Bread Temtem, I bet you'll still be able to do just fine on the end game island. You'll be able to battle in these buildings and you'll be able to get through the content. You might just not min max your rewards quite as much. Well, I think it's, it's totally fine and fair, right? I don't think anyone would take issue with that. They have the cosmetic store monetization they talked about as well in this section. And, you know, they said 10 times an online game. It's got server costs, it's got maintenance fees, and they have a growing development team that they want to be able to sustain. They said players only pay for the game once with no monthly fee and they want to keep it sustaining and growing though. And so they need money to come in. And I think that's totally fine. I mean, I get that. Some players just get so sensitive in this area um, about microtransactions and, and developers trying to get money out of players. But if you want a game that doesn't have a shelf life, doesn't have an expiration date, is constantly supported, constantly balanced and iterated on and new content's added, then there's got to be a way for 
the developers to get money. I mean, these are real people. This is their job. They have expenses. They have bills to pay. They want people to work on this game. They got to have money coming in. Um, of course, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And I think they're going the right way. They said that the cosmetic store will be purely cosmetic. They very strictly will not have pay to win or pay to skip things that you can buy. There's going to be no advantages gained. They're not going to sell Temtem. They're not going to gain sell fruits that improve Temtem stats. They're going to be just cosmetic items. So I said it's a little early to go into a lot of details on what type of cosmetic items, but it's going to be things like clothing, furniture, and emotes, and that there'll be periodic offers, so it'll be time limited, and you'll be able to purchase them with microtransactions. So I think it's great. I think it's a way that they'll be able to get money. People that appreciate the game can vote with their wallet and spend some money and get that money to Crema and get something out of it. They do mention the spring 2020 section is going to be their full 1.0 launch when the game will you know, be officially leaving early access. So we're about a year or 12 months away from that. And they said that there's also going to be daily and weekly quests. They don't go into details on what that is, but we can you know, speculate pretty easily that it'll just every, there'll be certain daily quests you can log in and complete. And there'll be longer term quests that you complete each week, all with rewards. So it's just adding to that more content, that more end game, that, that reason to give you to log in, do something meaningful and get rewards and get paid for it. And not just endlessly, repetitively grind, capture and tempt them over and over is the only thing that you can do. All right, finally, we have our last category, the summer 2021 part of the midterm roadmap. And in this, they have five more bullet points. They have Nuzlocke game mode. The third mythical Temtem, an arcade bar, draft PvP, and cosmetic battle pass. The two areas they go into in detail here is the cosmetic battle pass and Nuzlocke. They say the cosmetic battle pass after launch will be introducing some kind of battle S system. And what it is, is it's going to be an additional leveling system during seasons where you're able to obtain season cosmetics for free by playing during the season and completing objectives. But in addition, there'll also be a premium version of this where you can get more cosmetics and more non-pay-to-win rewards. So basically, it's a, a progression system that they're addling based on, I guess, the seasons of the PvP, or at least in some kind of seasonal format, um, giving you a reason to keep coming in and collecting items and, and cosmetics. And that you can get some of this stuff completely for free and get rewards for free without spending money and still participate in this feature. But if you want to spend some money... And being the premium version, you'll just have access to even more cosmetics and more pay, non-pay-to-win rewards, which I think is, again, it's great. It gives something for the free-to-play players, and it allows them to have an incentive to keep playing the game. But it's another way for them to bring in some money for the game. I mean, some people might be a little touchy about the cosmetic battle pass idea and, and what that could mean, but they seem very confident that it's not going to be, it's going to be purely cosmetic. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I know for sure I'll be, you know, spending the money on it. The other thing they go into detail to talk about is that Nuzlocke game mode. They say that it's a hardcore difficulty where if Temtem are knocked out permanently, um, they're gone if they get knocked out. So, And you'll only be limited in the number of Temtem you're able to capture. So you'll be able to capture two Temtems per area of the game. So you need to perfectly balance your resources to complete the game in this hardcore mode. And it will be a different instance of the server where only other Nuzlocke players will be on the map. And trading will be limited due to being Nuzlocke mode and the, and the restrained resources and pressures you're under. But that PvP will be enabled. And if you're brave enough that you can battle other players and face permanent losses of any temp time that you knock out. So, which I think that's crazy. I don't, Nuzlocke as itself sounds pretty hardcore, but interesting and challenging. and something I would definitely check out if I'm like, you know, had my fill of the other content for the week and I want to play some temp time. But I'm, you know, I'm all PvP'd out for the week and I'm done with all my quests and achievements. I would definitely see myself working on a Nuzlocke progression and character and see if I can get through the game. But man, fighting other players and permanently losing some of your attempt on that seems like high stakes. But hey, it's there for the really hardcore players. And it just uh, it just speaks to the game having a lot of depth and room for every type of player. So I think it's pretty exciting. The other items here that they don't really talk about, like they say draft PvP. I'm not sure what that is because they... The, the current ranked, uh, competitive matchmaking and, and queue for it already has a draft and pick ban system, but apparently there'll be something different with draft PvP, so looking forward to that. Um, they don't go into details on the arcade bar, but they talked about it in their Kickstarter game. It's basically like arcade games, and there'll be arcade games playable in the game. And like I said, there'll be a third mythical Temtem. 
So that breaks down and concludes the the entire roadmaps. But let's let's take let's take a step back. Let's talk about this. Let's look at what this all means. Let's try to make some inferences from this. So I've kind of divided this into three categories of content. So we can look at the big picture. And the first thing is just look at the main storyline content. It's telling us that there's going to be three more islands in addition to what there is now. So six total, as we, we previously knew, with eight dojos. There's going to be 80 more Temtem added, again, for a total of somewhere around 161. And there'll be a total of three mythical Temtem. So for really casual players who just want the story, that's what they have to look forward to. They can complete a, a Tempedia of 161 captures, a battle through six islands, and capture three legendaries. So this is kind of, you know, even for the non-casual players, I want to look at this and kind of think about, okay, how much game is there? What are we going to be able to do? So the first thing is play through six islands, complete your Tempedia, capture the three legendaries, and then um, move on to some of the other stuff that's in the game. And that's where I have this, this next area is this kind of fluff content that it's not necessarily repeatable and, and daily, weekly incentivized, but is, is going to keep you engaged and give you things to do. And that includes player housing, um, achievements and achievement hunting and working on unlocking all the achievements and the arcade mode and those are things that you know can definitely be endless time sinks but i anticipate that there will be a cap on the amount of time you spend doing all of these things there's only so much investment in your house that you're going to be able to work on and time you'll be able to spend there but that leaves the the last category which is by far the meatiest and the most bulky and that's kind of the endless content the time sink content the mmo part of the game what does Temtem really look like as an MMO on top of this core storyline and this fluffy content? What are you going to be able to do on a week-to-week, -week, on a day-to-day -day basis as a Temtem MMO player? Well, you're going to be able to complete daily quests every single day. So right there, you have something to do, to do every day. Yeah, it'll probably be a little repetitive and grindy, but the point is it's not just capturing Temtem over and over. You're going to have an incentive to log in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday if you can. And on top of that, there's going to be the weekly quest. So you're going to want to get your weekly quest done within the week. And maybe you'll wrap them up by the end of the week and you'll be done for the weekend and you'll do something else or play another game. But you'll want to come back and work on your weekly quest the next week. Um, there's going to, of course, be you know the biggest thing probably or one of the biggest is the ranked PvP with uh, the player ratings and the leagues. And you're going to want to constantly be pushing up your, your rating and seeing how high you can get it and seeing how high the league can get placed into within the season. And you're going to PvP, 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 and players are going to have a lot of fun. Players might eventually get as high as they think they can, and they're not making any more advancements. Um, and that's and they might spend a little bit less time doing that. But the great thing is, again, these are going to be seasoned-based. So once the season concludes, it's going to wipe the leagues and the placements. They're going to do a balance update. You're going to adjust your teams, and you're going to want to start fresh and, and jump right back into it. And you're going to have a lot of fun with that, I think, if that's up your alley. There's also the in-game tournaments, which is similar to the the, the PV for the PvP players. Is you're gonna, you might have your rank seasons uh, queuing going on, your your ladder climbing, but you're gonna especially want to show up for whenever these in-game tournaments are scheduled um, as part of the game. And of course, there's the already player community run tournaments, which I'm sure let's be more and more of, especially as they add these features in the spectator mode. And of course, for the non-PVPers. There's always going to be Luma hunting. There'll always be people chasing down those Lumas, getting those uh, shinies, if this were Pokemon, for those that don't remember. And there's going to be people that are all about making money and farming money by releasing Temtem, um, but more importantly, the breeders. There's going to be people that are full-time just Temtem breeders and Temtem traders using that trading house to constantly be flipping Temtem, breeding Temtem, selling Temtem, and just making as much money as possible and, and be a lot richer than I think I'll ever will be. But back to the PvPers and the people that are more social and, and don't want to just aren't just about hyper competitive um, PvP, but want to make investments um, socially by developing friends and recruiting members and their clubs and breeding Temtem for their clubs. There's going to be the the dojo wars and the clubs, and constantly we're going to be capturing and fighting over dojos and holding dojos, and getting rewards from dojos, and that's definitely going to keep people keep logging and keep playing. For PvE. There's going to be that end game island with the PVE content and the rewards that you can get there and the different buildings that you can battle in. And of course, Nuzlocke mode for the really hardcore PVE players that uh, really want to challenge and really want to play the game methodically and, and carefully and slowly. 
Don't forget, of course, the, the draft PvP, whatever that might be, and the cosmetic battle pass where you have this additional progressive system and cosmetics to collect. So I think it's really good overall. You know, taking a step back, I'm, I'm happy about this. I think it's going to be a really engaging game. I think there's going to be constantly um, achievements and cosmetic items and ratings and money that we're going to be chasing. And there's going to be a carrot on the stick that's going to keep us incentivized to play, but also hopefully in a meaningful and fun way. So I'm very optimistic and I have great high hopes for this game moving forward. All right, that's going to do it for today, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for episode two of Tem Talk. I really appreciate you spending this time with me. If you have any questions or comments or want to get in touch, please email me at temtalkshow at gmail.com. Finally, please leave me those five-star reviews on iTunes. It really helps get visibility and awareness for the show and will let us build the community around Temtem together. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Thank you.